European Union officials in Brussels are meeting virtually with Chinese leaders for their first summit in two years. High on the agenda is Beijing's perceived neutrality over Russia's invasion of Ukraine. EU leaders are likely to seek assurances that China won't agree to Russia's request for arms supplies and won't help Moscow evade Western economic sanctions. Well, let's get more from uh, our DW correspondent, Barbara Wieser, in Brussels. Uh, Barbara, uh, this meeting has been going on. Were, were there any indications as to which side Beijing supports um, at today's EU-China summit? Uh, any tendency you could make out? I mean, we heard from uh, Chinese uh, diplomats uh, after the meeting with the Chinese prime minister. At the moment, the meeting with President Xi himself is underway. And uh, what they said was, yeah, China doesn't want to be forced to pick sides. So they don't want to come down on either sides and they don't want to be really disturbed or questions about, uh, questioned about their strategic relationship with Russia. So that was a given. It was quite clear from the beginning uh, of this uh, summit, of uh, this virtual summit, that, uh, of course, there was no prizing away of Russia from the Chinese embrace. That would continue. It's just a question of how tight it is. Now, for, of course, uh, China is trying to sort of play both uh, ends against the middle here, uh, or if you will, ride the tiger, because on one hand, they want to still continue the closeness with, and the support for President Putin. On the other hand, they do need their biggest trade partner, the European Union. This is where their, uh, where their economic growth is made and created and supported. So they can't afford a real a trade war, for instance, or sanctions or, or a real, yeah. uh, real problems with the EU. And that, though, this is what China is trying to balance carefully and, and sort of hiding itself under a lot of diplomatic verbiage. Right. I mean, riding the tiger, you say, China state broadcaster CCTV quoted the premier as saying China will push for peace talks between Ukraine and Russia in its own way. What could that mean? In its own way, yeah, that's diplomacy. I mean, it just means that, yeah, we will talk to Putin maybe behind closed doors and we will tell him, you know, uh, don't uh, sort of uh, do this in a too brutal manner or maybe they could find a way to sort of uh, stop the war and, and, and have an off-ramp within a certain amount of time. They're not going to, of course, push put any real pressure on Putin. Plus, Putin probably wouldn't listen. I mean, we, we see this very delicate balance of, of the, of the blocks here. We see Russia on one hand, they need the support of China because they're mm. still trading with China and China is now buying, for instance, Russian oil. On the other hand, China needs Europe uh, right. because uh, that is where the economic growth comes from. But the European Union also needs China and they need China to acknowledge their security interests. So it's you see those three poles that really have to sort of figure out how to balance their interests against each other. And at the moment, we have a very clear message here from Europe uh, saying uh, Beijing needs to listen to us. They need to acknowledge that this is our security here in Europe. We're talking about it's central and it's crucial to us uh, and they cannot override our interests here and we will sort of push against that. And so this is really what, what makes this meeting so important but we will not have any concrete direct results. This is about politics by talking. All right. Well, it's better to talk than not to talk. Uh, thank you, Barbara Wiesel in Brussels. Meanwhile, EU leaders will urge China not to support Russia in its war in Ukraine. At a virtual summit being held on Friday, Brussels will warn Chinese Premier Xi Jinping that helping Moscow to avoid Western sanctions would harm already strained relations with some of China's biggest trading partners. In 2020, imports and exports between China and the EU totaled 586 billion euros, representing 16% of the EU's total trade in goods. However, China's trade with one EU member in particular, Lithuania, has been all but wiped out. It's down 91% in recent months. That was after Lithuania allowed Taiwan to open a de facto embassy in Vilnius. China considers Taiwan its own territory, of course. But that's not the only thing straining relations between Brussels and Beijing. In 2020, they signed a major agreement on investment. However, the EU pushed the pause button last year, citing China's alleged human rights violations in the Xinjiang region. So, 
Can anything be achieved during the latest round of talks between Brussels and Beijing? Well, I'm joined in the studio by our resident China watcher, Clifford Coonan. Um, Clifford, a lot's changed between the EU and China, hasn't it, since they signed that investment deal? Yes, I mean, it's, it's like a sea change, basically. What you've seen was, um, I mean, at the time you had the, the problem uh, for the EU that the, between the Commission and the Parliament, that the Commission had, had wanted to push the deal, particularly from the German side. The Germans were very keen to push it, um, but the Parliament was saying no because of the Xinjiang uh, situation and also Hong Kong. Um, but now, um, since then, the situation has even become even more tense because of, of the war with, the, um, with Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And um, basically now China's backing of Ukraine uh, in this situation has made it very, very difficult for them to come up with the, for, for, the, for them to actually back the deal because they need to put pressure on China to, to take a side, to, to sort of take the EU side rather in the war. Yeah, so is it going through the minds of the government in Beijing that, you know, the EU is a major trading partner and maybe if Beijing does continue to support Moscow, trade relations could suffer and they could lose a major market? Absolutely. And I think, um, you know, I, th I think that basically China has always viewed the EU um, as a bloc, but also individually. And it's been quite happy to sort of... Um, to almost, you know, create a, a, a breach between the, the different members of the EU. Divide and conquer. <laughs> Divide and conquer, exactly. And um, there's been a lot of that going on, you know, and um, I think that's going to be, um, increasingly that's going to be a big issue now, as we've seen with, um, with say, Lithuania, for example. Yeah, actually, let's, let's talk about um, Lithuania. I mean, how big is an impact uh, of an impact is, you know, there's this embargo on trade with just one member of the EU having on relations between Beijing and Brussels? Well, I think initially there was, uh, the, um, the EU tried to, to sort of calm things down a bit and, and uh, act as if it wasn't a major issue. But um, the thing is, this is a member of the EU, which is being having this, as you mentioned, you know, this, this de, de facto embargo on, on trade. And um, also, at the same time, you've got sanctions on individual members, like parliamentarians in the, in the EU. So there's a lot of issues like this, which are um, uh, very annoying to the EU, basically. And they're... Um, and, Given the fact that China is backing Russia in the war, um, whereas before they could maybe try and, and, and negotiate on these angles, there's just too much now for, for, for everything to go smoothly. There's too many things going on. There's too many breaches in, 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 the, in the dam, you know? Yeah, and, and actually there's been a concerted effort from Brussels to create a competitive programme for Belt and Road. Mm. Is that something that's now become a little more pressing? Yeah, I think I think that um, the EU is realizing that um, there's a German phrase "Wandel uh, durch Handel," you know, the, the idea of change through trade, um, and they've been pushing that for a long time. I think even the big German firms are realizing now that this won't work. I mean, VW is now investing heavily in the US, for example. Uh, there's a lot of there's a lot there's a kind of a shift away from China. There's a realization that. Um, you can't sort of separate the, the political stuff from the trade stuff. And I think this is turning into a, a major factor and it's going to be a big, a big factor in these talks today. We've got Li Keqiang has already spoken, Xi Jinping is coming later. So it's going to be, um, I mean, these are very high level talks, but on completely different terms than from what we had a year ago. And just lastly, something we should talk about, a big story out of China this week was the very sudden lockdown in Shanghai. Is that mm. having an impact on businesses in Europe trying to trade with the Chinese? Yeah, the lockdowns are, are a major thing. I mean, Volkswagen has had to suspend production. Uh, it's only for, for a few days. Um, but clearly, the idea of China as a, as a reliable source of, of, of goods in the, in the supply chain is, is now being called into question. Um, and I think that you're going to see a lot more um, investment in areas around China and in, in other countries to, to, to sort of bridge this gap in the supply chain. And um, the, the whole relationship is changing. OK, Clifford Coonan, thank you very much for staying across the subject for us. Let's get some background on this from Daniela Schwarzer. She's the executive director of the Open Society Foundations in Europe and Eurasia. Uh, a group founded by the financier George Soros. Daniela, uh, is it fair to say that the war in Ukraine could mark a tipping point in EU-China relations, perhaps away from partnership and towards more rivalry? 
that is possible if China more openly sides with Russia than it already does. And in fact, you know, China has not condemned this war. It has spoken about uh, Ukraine's sovereignty, that it should be protected. But beyond that, there was really nothing that would show that Beijing uh, stands up against uh, this war. Uh, quite the contrary, in February, just before the war started, uh, both Putin and uh, Xi Jinping met in uh, Beijing. And they issued a rather long statement, which really is a, a kind of authoritarian redefinition of the world order. And they kind of um, try to redefine democracy as well and position their respective mm. countries as the better ones. And that shows you that beyond the conflict, there is a growing alliance between two major authoritarian regimes in the world, and that has to worry Europe. Uh, the Chinese foreign minister uh, warned earlier this week that it would not be enough to rule that nations are either friend or foe in this complex situation. What approach can the EU take here? Well, the EU needs China in several ways. One is obviously uh, trade and investment ties, and that's a mutual interest. And then there's a second mutual interest, and that is that both the EU and China and the US, of course, need to work together to tackle global problems. Climate change and its repercussions is one of them, global pandemics, or also developments in the global south, which will seriously deteriorate because of Russia's war in Ukraine, food shortages and the like. So there is a real agenda for them where they should look at global public goods together. But on the other hand, there is a systemic conflict between the two, and that already plays right into the European Union. If you take, for instance, Chinese interference in EU democracies, also the, the regulatory competition uh, on IT and tech issues, which are fundamental for the question of democracy and data protection. So the, I think the EU needs to take a approach which on the one hand, protects its own interests, and that is mainly the dimension of the systemic mm. conflict. And then they have to look at the joint agenda where they have mutual interests. But it may well be that if China gets involved in this war, uh, there will be a totally new debate, and that is on sanctioning China, which will be very costly for Europe compared to the United States. Uh Talk to us about Beijing's interests here in, in this conflict. Why are they still supporting Putin? Beijing pursues a very long-term strategy, and that is really Chinese, uh, China's rise to being the number one world power, both in economic and tech, but also in political terms, and it's also trying to change the world order according to its own ideas. It, it does want an order, but it's just not the Western liberal democratic one. And for that, Russia can, of course, be an ally, and it is, as we have seen through the statement that both leaders issued in February. Um, China is interested in Russia in terms of energy provision, other resources, and it can also benefit not only from Europe's weakness, because this war is, of course, challenging and costly, but also in the event of a weak Russia, China will know how to exploit that situation. Mm. I don't think China has a particular interest in the concrete conflict, Russia against Ukraine. It's far more looking at uh, the global landscape and Beijing will surely ask itself, how does this new fit situation fit into our strategy, which is much more long term and goes well mm. beyond that conflict? Thank you very much, Daniela Schwarzer, the executive director of the Open Society Foundations in Europe and Eurasia. Thank you.